This is back to back. What's up, Back to Backers? This is Willie Joy. Welcome to the final Back to Back of 2017. I hope you guys are having good holidays. I hope you got some time off, some time to relax. And this episode, this is my late Christmas present to all you guys. But it was worth the wait, I promise, because my guest on the show today is 12th Planet. He's been called the king of American dubstep. He's an old friend of mine. Pretty much, if you've ever hung out with him, you know he is one of the best people to spend a little time with. And these days, there's a lot going on in the world of 12th Planet. The planet of 12th Planet, I guess. He just signed to Disciple Records, and he launched his own new sub-label with them called Disciple Roundtable. He released a new EP called Let Us Pray, and right now he's out headlining his own tour, the So Sick Tour, He's in the States right now, 2018. He brings the tour to Asia, Australia, South America. He's going all over the world through April. I'm going to put a link to all of the new music and all of the tour dates in the description of this podcast. Before we get into that conversation, you know, like I said, this is the last episode of 2017 for Back to Back. And, you know, end of the year, I think it's only natural that we reflect a little bit on everything that's happened in the last 12 months. And, you know, I launched this podcast uh, a couple months into 2017. And before that, I had been working on it already. And so for me to come to the end of the year with back to back doing as well as it is and, you know, with all the support from you guys, I just couldn't be more happy or more grateful to have such awesome listeners like all of you guys. I could not have done this without you guys tuning in every week, without you writing into me. You know, you can always email me at backtobackpod at gmail.com. I'm here for your questions. I'm here for your concerns. You can reach out to me on social media. At Willie Joy is my handle on all social media. I love it when you guys tweet out at me and at other artists that you want to see appear on the show. You know, all of your guys' involvement with the show, your excitement for it each week, all the feedback you send me, the reviews you leave on iTunes, all of it. I read it all. It means a lot, and it just gets me more stoked to make the show even better week after week. I promise we are just getting started. We've got some really big ideas for where we want to take the show in 2018, and I'm so happy you guys are along for the ride. That's just my little speech for you. I'm feeling really thankful at the end of the year. I hope all of you guys are having a good end of your year, whether you're listening to this at home, taking a break from the family, Maybe you're at the gym, maybe you're in the car going to return some presents that you never really wanted in the first place. Whatever it is, I'm glad to be here with you, and I wish you guys nothing but the best going into 2018. Don't forget to subscribe to this show on whatever platform you're using to listen. That way, I can send you something new every single week of next year. That's my promise to you guys. So, for this conversation with 12th Planet, we met up at his hotel. Uh, We actually met up at the rooftop bar, had a couple drinks, and then went back to the hotel room to have this conversation. And I was really happy to be able to grab this time with John because if you ever spend any time with him, he is just a social force. Always a group of people around, always a lot of people kind of vying for his attention because he really is just one of those people who can light up a room. People love to be around him, and he is kind of that true party archetype. As far as I can tell, he's always in party mode, and he's just one of those people that anytime he shows up, you know that the night is about to go up another level. But those qualities are kind of exactly why he has the status that he does as, you know, the the godfather of dubstep in America. And we talk about how he was able to kind of connect the lines of dubstep from its roots in the UK to bringing it over to the US. And I think it really is his deep love of this music 
and just his fandom in general. He knows everything about it from day one all the way up till now because dubstep is still a new art form. It's very young. It's still evolving constantly. Every few years, there's a new mutation, a new iteration. And 12th Planet has been there for all of it. He's helped guide it. He's still one of the figureheads of the sound and of the scene. There's not many people who can see as much success as 12th Planet has had and still claim to be underground. But if you talk to John even for a minute, and you'll hear it right away in this conversation, he truly has never lost that underground attitude. He's still out there championing the weird sounds, the new sounds, the cutting edge. And, you know, despite keeping it underground, keeping it real, the mainstream can't help but give him the accolades, too. You know, DJ Mag just named him North American Producer of the Year. It's pretty wild, man. 20 years in the game, still having big year after big year. John's an inspirational dude. There truly is no one else like him in the game. And after several failed attempts, I was really happy we finally got to link and have this conversation you're about to hear. It was fun, we got loose, a few drinks were had, and then we really got into it. So let's you and me get into it right now. This is me and 12th Planet, back to back, let's go. That's intense. (laughs) Coagulated blood. (laughs) Well, well, to our three listeners we have left. (laughs) But but no, man, I'm really glad we linked up to do this. The the last time... Are you cool if we just jump into it? Yeah, let's just jump into it. I wish we were recording everything from... Our conversation I know, earlier. I know. It was so good. It was. But I'm going to reference a couple of things because the last time I saw you, you were with Valentino and you guys had just gone to see some wrestling. Oh, my that, God. That was the last time I saw you, man. <laughs> and I feel like you and him, but maybe you even more so, are just the, the fandom of you guys for wrestling is crazy. How do you even find time to go to that many wrestling events? That is such a tough question because like Valentino, like myself, we um, we both are wrestling fans from when we were children. Okay. And it's you get indoctrinated and... I was a huge wrestling fan when I was yeah. a kid. Yeah. And I didn't really get back into it until about four or five years ago. Um I had some friends in New York. I was playing EDC at the time, and it was the same weekend as WrestleMania. So it was EDC and WrestleMania at the same time what in New York What a double City. header, man. Double header. <laughs> so if there's ever a time to get back into it, that was it. And uh, I remember uh, seeing CM Punk and seeing that the wrestlers were shooting from the hip, which means like they're like talking shit about the guy in front of them but like it teeters on reality Mm. and also like kayfabe or acting Mm. and from that like it really got me into like got me back into watching wrestling you know like yeah i probably hadn't watched it in about 10 years since then i just thought it it got a little stale um this it was the same guys over and over uh no one knew coming in but cm punk kind of like just was a breath of fresh air, like to see someone who was a straight edge good guy in real life, but like is portrayed as a bad guy mm. in the storyline. Well, I mean, it's it's the fandom too that I've always really liked because you're it, it, you strike me as a guy who really gets deep into whatever you're a fan of, right? That's true. Like we were just at the bar and we were talking about your love of Game of Thrones. <laughs> and you could you could give like a dissertation on Easily. Game of Thrones. Easily. I've heard you do it. <laughs> and that's special to me, man, because I I love fandom in general. And I think as artists, at least for me, it's important for me to have something that I can just be a fan of and not something that I'm involved with, like music. You know what I mean? Exactly. I, I don't know if it's the same for you, but for me, it's I, I get creatively renewed when I can just kind of like become a kid again and be a fan of something that I don't have anything to do with. That's exactly why I really love it. I, I love how 
alike it is to DJ culture and being a producer. We're like, you know, like as an artist, we're looking for a lot of ways to, I'm going to use a wrestling term, to get over with the crowd. Getting over means doing whatever it takes to get the crowd to remember your set mm. or to remember uh, something about you. So then the next time you come back, the whole crowd does it. Case in point, um, I've been doing this uh, wrestling Daniel Bryant chant, which is uh, he basically takes his two hands and he puts them in the air and he goes, yes, 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 over and over. And everyone puts their hands in the air every time he says yes. Right. I've been doing that at the end of all my sets, and now people start to do it really? during my sets. And it's just a way to get over. That's an interesting way to look at it, man. Yeah. I mean, I love doing it just because that guy is one of my favorite wrestlers. Right. You know, but uh, to see that people who don't even watch wrestling see that in my set and like they can identify with it and they yeah, do it. Yeah, it's like, like a yeah. universal thing. It's a right? universal thing. It just feels good. Same thing with the suck it, you know, like uh, <laughs> Degeneration X, like with uh, Shawn Michaels and uh, Triple H, China. They used to do this. Um, it's kind of, I call it the reverse excision. Like excision puts the X, he puts his two arms up in an X formation right. over his head. Right. But like the original wrestling one is like down right by your crotch. Oh, yeah. 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 I do that shit all the time. People <laughs> love it. It's fucking awesome. Yeah. I've, done, I've been guilty of doing that once <laughs> <Yeah>. or twice. <laughs> Especially in middle school, man. Like we're the same age, so you understand. Yeah, dude, yeah. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have you always been that way that, you know, if you got into something, you were all in? I'm always all in. It doesn't matter if it's wrestling, Game of Thrones, Legos, okay. Pogs. Those were big? Those are all big for me. Yeah. Like Once I get sucked into something, I just want to immerse myself into it. And uh, I want to be part of the culture. Yeah. And I want to be like, somewhere deep in the back of my mind. Maybe I want to be remembered as a person mm. who was affiliated yeah. with that. Or, I don't want to be a middle of the mall guy. I want to be someone remembered for something. Do you know or have you ever thought about why music is different? That music, you you said, I'm going to participate. I'm not just a fan. I think I've had that same mentality since I was, I started raving when I was about 12, 14, okay. or sorry, 14 years old. I was going to say 12. Yeah, 14, 14. Freshman year of high school, you know, I met some kids that were going to my high school that were raving at the time. Yeah. And, you know, it was a whole different ball game. You grew but up in L.A., I right? grew up in Los Angeles, and this is all I know. And rave culture was big business even in the mid and early 90s. Right. It was just underground, right? Still popular, but just not as I wouldn't as say regulated. that it was underground because there was multiple movies made about it. Like, you can go with Go yeah. and um, uh, Mon Party Monster. and uh, That's th true. There's tons of rave movies that were around. Kids was the one that really put me on really like i remember kids came out when i was in seventh grade there was this girl in my class like uh, seventh grade social studies class uh we had a conversation about what was the movie that everyone was looking forward to seeing okay. and a lot of people were like oh i want to see batman i want to see uh this that and the third and there was this one girl in my class that said she wanted to see this movie kids and i didn't know what kids was yeah uh i i went to uh god I can't remember the name of the movie, but there was a trailer for kids. And I noticed it was about a bunch of kids skateboarding, smoking pot, <laughs> going to raves in New York. And had you had experiences with I those had, things already? I had no experiences okay. with any of that stuff. Yeah. And I, I, was a skate, I was skating and playing sports and stuff like that. But the only thing that I could tie myself to was the fact that these guys were all skating. And they were sponsored too, you know? Right. So I saw them in Thrasher magazine, and then they had a movie. I realized that counterculture, it's a movement. It's like you don't just half-ass counterculture. You go full speed, mm. and that's a part of you, you know? So you got really inspired from those images. And, oh, yeah. yeah. The image of, like, <laughs> for lack of a better, is uh, Casper doing the whippets. You know, he's oh, like, I remember that. Yeah, and he's like, "Oh God!" And he has this blue face. And I didn't. Know, what the fuck is that? You know, <laughs> it was all a part of his shtick. It was all a part of his persona. Yeah. And not only was he a skateboarder, he was a diehard raver. 
So who was around you at this time? I mean, were you and this girl kind of the only two people interested in this? I was not interested what was in your raving crowd? in seventh and eighth grade okay. at all. And I don't think she was either. Okay. She was like, maybe she had an older brother. Yeah. And the, the cool thing to say was, I want to see that movie Kids. You know, I didn't see kids until about two years later. Sure. Yeah. Just growing up, I guess I'm curious, you know, what did your parents do? Like what was leading up to, to seeing kids and having that moment? <laughs> you know, what what was your life like? What part of L.A. are you even from? I'm from know. South L.A. Okay. Like uh, if you want to get technical, it's called West Athens. Okay. But it's kind of on the border of uh, the South Bay and South Los Angeles. So I guess the nearest cities would be like Gardena, Hawthorne, Lawndale. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Compton, right. L.A., Inglewood. Was it a rough place to grow up? Or? In the 80s and 90s, it was really rough. Yeah. It was totally like that movie Colors. It was Bloods and Crips. Yeah, because that's, like, that's in my mind. I, you know, I hear South L.A. in the early 90s, and that's the image, but I don't, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. man. I mean, it was nuts. Like, growing up in a neighborhood, too, I grew up in a predominantly Crip neighborhood. I'm not even going to say predominantly. It was a full Crip neighborhood. Mm. And it's like, you know, any kid that wore red in my street, he got the shit beat out of me. Really? You know, there was a park, Helen Keller Park, right by my house, man, like shootings all the time. I remember uh, police helicopters, ghetto bird flying over the house wow. all the time. Uh, was there pressure to be involved with that stuff? As a as There a was kid? a lot of pressure to be in the gang, you know, but I went to Catholic school. My parents, like, kind of kept me away from all that stuff, yeah. and I loved them for it. My dad is from Ghana, so I'm a first-generation American, you know. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, so, like, my dad, he kept me on a straight and narrow, made sure, like, instead of me – Hanging on the corner. Uh, I was going to the library oh, man. every Friday and Saturday and Sunday. Ghanaians don't play around, Yeah, man. they do not, yeah. man. I had, uh, I had a drumming teacher in, in college who was, used to be a drummer for the Royal Court of Ghana. Oh, wow. And he was the most hard-ass teacher. <laughs> <laughs> man, it's like when you... I didn't realize until I seen my dad's home, you know, it's like when you come from poverty, you don't want the generation after you to do the same so sure. you're gonna like ride him like a bull so like i had like all these surroundings and temptations to do like you know i mean i was still tagging and being a stupid ass la fucking teenager kid but i did my homework i went to private school right i went to a really good high school in la and and it's called Loyola. So all my Cubs out there that are listening to this, I'm representing for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so after kids, after seeing the movie, hearing about it, what was your next exposure to electronic music? Or was were you playing instruments? Uh, I was. I, I started playing instruments. You know, uh, been playing guitar, bass, drums since fuck, like seventh grade. Okay. Sixth grade. So it's been a part of your life. It's been a part a of my life. Time. Even though I can't, I can't, or at that time I couldn't read music. You know, you're just sight, you know, looking down at the keys. Yeah. And just playing along, you know. I just wanted to, I knew that music was somewhere inside of me, but like. What kind of music were you into at that time? Um, I was playing whatever was being taught to me on like the Yamaha keyboard. <laughs> right. Like, you know, it's like those keyboards where it, you can play along with it yeah, and it totally. lights up the keys. Yeah. And that's how I kind of learned how to play piano. Oh, wow. Uh, I had a friend when I went to summer school. He 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 played bass guitar. He taught me how to play bass guitar. From learning how to play bass guitar, it's pretty easy to jump to guitar. Yeah. And then drums, you know, it's kind of like playing piano. And luckily, uh, the high school that I went to, it's like a feeder school for all of Los Angeles. So I had people from all over the city, like not just South Central, but I mean, Pasadena, the West Side, South Bay, San Diego, everyone's driving up to come to this school. Wow. To, like, you know, and, and, and like a thousand, two thousand kids apply to this school, only 300 kids get in. Oh, wow. And it's, 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 it's a really good community. So the people that I was surrounded with really helped me out. And like, you know, I remember in high school, uh, some of my friends, we were trading tablatures, you yeah. know, for guitar. Like, oh, check, I just learned uh, A sharp minor. Like, I just learned uh, harmonic minor. I just learned melodic minor. I just learned mixolydian. Right. And we were just trading the actual tabs and also reading Guitar Magazine with 
all kinds of tablatures in it. Yeah, I remember that too. I always, I had a guitar and I took lessons. I could never really play. I was <laughs> never good, but I was obsessed with tabs. I would, I had so many, almost like the way you would later trade like MP3s or exactly. something. Yeah. And this is pre-Napster. I'm an old fart. Yeah. You know? No, yeah. me too, man. <laughs> I'm right there with you. I think Napster came around like my senior year of high school. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Napster in college for yeah. sure, right around that time. Going forward from there, we, I assume you started playing in bands or something at a certain point. Oh, yeah. Like, like most kids do. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing else to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. And if, <laughs> especially if uh, your parents are trying to keep you out of trouble. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they were probably happy about the music. Right? Oh, they were not too happy no? with it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they would have much rather me be on a chess team or some well, yeah. corny shit. You know? <laughs> I mean, I got no qualms. I love chess. I love all these games. And like hindsight is always 2020. But when you're a 14 year old kid growing up in Los Angeles, you don't want to be in a fucking chess club. <laughs> you want to fucking be a tagger. You want to gangbang. You want to go raving. You want to do some crazy shit. True, know? man. Well, I mean, or did a surfer, you... skateboard, you know, anything counterculture. True. So did you fall into one of those scenes? I think I fell into all of those scenes, <laughs> minus gangbanging. I, I never right. went to a set because I noticed that, you know, a lot of the guys in sets, uh, they're not the smartest guys. They might be the toughest guys on the street, but it's like, you can't have a conversation with a guy like that. You know what I mean? And I, I always um, consider myself to be above that. Yeah, yeah. I always kept my friends. I had friends that were banging at the time, you know, but I never wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be something greater, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, you know, maybe maybe part of that is your parents, you know, wanting that for you. I do think that rubs off. You know? Oh, yeah. And so when did electronic music enter the picture? You know, when did you really have a real life experience with it? I mean, my first dance music experiences really came uh, junior high school because uh, there was a radio station in L.A. called Power 106. Yep. Back then, they were playing... 90% house music. Uh, DJ Humpty Vision, DJ Henry, Swedish Eagle. These guys were on the radio all the time on Power 106. And hip-hop was only kind of the, the drive time show, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. It was these guys called the Baker Boys, and they had yeah, a hip-hop show. Yeah, yeah, they were syndicated all over the country. But most of the time on that station, you were hearing house music. I didn't know that. That's yeah. interesting. And... That's my first foray into that. And this elementary school that I went to, everybody else was into the same thing. Oh, wow. So we would have these things called, uh, back then we called them kickbacks, where it's not like a party where you go over someone's house and you drink a fucking keg. It's like you're going to go over your friend's house and all your parents are there watching you, <laughs> but everyone's dancing to Deep House with everyone in your class you oh know? wow it's just like a an all ages rave kind it's of an thing. all ages rave with your parents there. right right and yeah. we're drinking fruit punch and you know some of the homies you know that we'd sneak in a occasional 40 and split it between the whole basketball team or whatever. <laughs> 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 yeah. oh man those were the days but that was really my first foray in the dance music it was like a here in house on power 106 yeah so by the time i got to high school uh there was people from all different areas of Los Angeles. And so I was already familiar with house, yeah. but then some of the kids I met there were like, yo, have you heard of this thing called hardcore or gabber? And which is house, yeah. but really fast yeah. when with a lot of hip hop vocals. That was stuff. huge for me in the Midwest. Yeah. Like, gabber was everything. To gabber me. was everything to me, man. Yeah. That was my first foray into rave culture was hearing hardcore and gabber and then getting mixtapes you know, trading mixtapes with the homies. And then one day, I think it was like midway through my freshman year, my boy was like, hey, there's this party. Uh, this crew is called Cartoon Network <laughs> with a K. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's got to be like, you know, if it's a rave thing, it's got to have a K of and course. E yeah. and X, something in it. You know, it's like Cartoon Network. Uh, um, so I went to that party, man. It was this guy, Assassin, and this other guy, Deacon, uh, Omar Santana. And you're taking me back with these Yeah, names. man. And I just didn't know what the fuck was going on. And I was sober this time, you know? I didn't really drop my first pill till like, uh, my second rave, you know? Okay. And um, once I dropped my first pill, 
man, everything made so much sense. Like, really? Yeah, and you know how ecstasy makes people feel. It makes, you know, you become one with everyone. Like, you want to hug. It doesn't matter if this person's from Rancho Cucamonga or this person's <laughs> from whatever. The fact that you're in the same room dancing to this weird-ass music that no one cares about, right. you're wearing Mickey Mouse gloves and seatbelt and fucking super baggy gat, be- yeah. gat jeans. You yeah, know? it's worth talking about, you know, just the differences in the way people looked and the way people thought about it back then as opposed to now, you know? Oh, yeah. Because it wasn't something in mainstream consciousness, you know? It Not was something you really had to actively seek out. Oh, yeah. And so I think, at least for me, then when you finally made it to the event, and there weren't as many events either, so it was a special thing. And, you know, for me, once I finally made it there, you got in the door you saw all these other people dressed really weird and you know from all walks of life all sexual orientations you know every all different races everything <laughs> it was you know it was like something out of a movie like i'd never seen anything like it completely out of a movie and unscripted <laughs> right right <laughs> like, yeah i'm gonna go against what you just said a little bit because like in california or in la rave culture i mean there was multiple raves yeah Every Thursday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Sure. I mean, granted, sometimes you'd have to drive all the way to San Bernardino to go to them. There was a few places like the Master Dome and um, and Pomona, the Glass House. Yeah, and, yeah. And I mean, you know, I should be more accurate. Even in Minnesota, I mean, there was something every weekend. Yeah, for sure, yeah. For sure. Really, the difference is now it's mainstream. You it's know? mainstream. It's every fun. club on the strip, you know, oh, that yeah. kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Back then, we used to have this thing called Rave Links. And it was a website that you went to, and it would have all the raves listed on it. There was also info lines, you know, like you yeah. call the LA Unified line. This girl, she would like tell you, hey, today's Friday. Here's the date. This is going on here. This is the info line for that party. Here's the map point, blah, blah, blah. So if yeah. you're in the drum and bass, if you're in the hardcore, if you're in the house, whatever, there was something for you at that time right and then granted there wasn't it wasn't legal yeah yeah well hence the map point which i think maybe some of our listeners don't even know about the map point which you know basically you call the line you get uh, directions to a random place and you show up and it's usually just a person standing in a parking lot handing out you know paper (laughs) leaflets with more directions to get to the actual event i mean fuck man those are the days those are the days (laughs) none of that shit was do you remember that episode in beverly hills 90210 probably when uh it was uh the drug was called euphoria (laughs) and like brandon walsh and all of his uh cronies they go to a map point and like they're like, "Hey, I'm supposed to give you an egg," <laughs> <laughs> and the guy they go to the wrong place. But anyway, yeah, they end up finding the rave and like the rest is history. Right. But I mean, that was kind of like the, the the culture that I come from. Yeah. You know, I remember the first EDC I went to was like at the Shrine, mm. and uh, there were rides there, but no one was allowed to ride them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That must have been one of the first ones that Pasquale did. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, yeah, because like at that time, you know, EDC was the smaller party and Nocturnal Wonderland was the bigger party. Right. But my like Insomniac and Channel 36, B3 Candy, those guys were really the ones that really shaped my brain on like what a rave is and, yeah. and what a DJ is. And from learning what a DJ was like because up until maybe my junior year I thought that the DJ was making the music as he plays oh, yeah, live yeah. and then I found out that it's two turntables obviously <laughs> and that they were playing other people's music right back then like when you would get we, we, they were called pure acid mixtapes uh, uh, it was a distribution company that basically put every DJ over and they never put track lists on the mixes right and then one day, I remember one time they put a track list on the back of a mix, and I was like, oh, well, who's moving 808s? Who's Ed Rush? Who is this? Who's yeah. Omar Santana? Or I saw the guys that were raving, but I didn't know who they were playing. Right. And then once I realized that it was an art form that like people had these major studios back then, like it wasn't Ableton or Logic. It was like these motherfuckers were spending $50,000 yeah. on a studio the only to option. make a goddamn song. Yeah. yeah. I mean, once you drop money on a board, a sampler, a few synthesizers, 
a few effects. Right. Racks. I mean, back in those days, you know, now DJs kind of have one over on bands because to be a DJ, all you need is the laptop. That's but it. Back then, you needed more gear than the bands had. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I never really thought about that. <laughs> but so how did you come to wanting to do it yourself? How did you actually start, you know, fucking around with turntables? As egocentric as this sounds, I think I was at an EDC. It was at this water park called Lake Dolores, mm. which is in between Las Vegas and LA. And I mean, if you drive past Lake Dolores now, it's a fucking ghost town. <laughs> yeah. But back then it was thriving. And so I went to this party. I, don't, I can't remember the name of the DJ, but he had just finished playing. And I just remember there was these two or three girls that came right up to him and a golf cart picked him up and he shipped <laughs> off and he was the man. Everyone was cheering for him. And I was like, wow, he gets that much respect in this place. And then that comes back to me wanting, I'm a fandom right. guy and like, I want to immerse myself in something. So, you know what? I want to be like that guy. Yeah, yeah. So I started from the bottom. I started passing out flyers for insomniac back in the day through my boy, Jeff Williams. I started wanting to throw my own parties and, uh, that was the only way to get play at that time. Yeah, it was hard being a DJ, especially if you were going to play drum and bass or hardcore, because the scene was so Insular, carved right? out. It was yeah. like at, like everyone had a job. Yeah, and if you were going to come in, you're taking somebody else's money. Right. So they didn't really let a lot of new people in. Yeah. But so my way in was I was like I'm going to be an MC. And that way I can host the show, be front of the show, and get to play with every single DJ that I could. Yeah, that's smart. And that way, from there, then I was able to pass all my music to all the artists that were, that yeah. were DJing. Yeah. So did you start producing around that same time? Were you already making I was songs? already producing. Okay. And um, I wasn't really fully DJing because I didn't own turntables. Uh-huh. I was always playing at my friend's house and practicing, but I could definitely MC because you didn't. That didn't require money, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, and, the, and I and, knew all the names of the tracks. I knew all the songs. I knew when the breakdowns were coming. I knew when. You know. Yeah, and, and you know, it's worth saying drum and bass being kind of how you got your name out there in the yeah. first place. That drum and bass comes from the UK, right? Yeah. And so for MCs, there's a lot of drum and bass MCs in the UK, not a lot of drum and bass MCs in the US, especially at that time. You're right. You know, so I think finding that niche, like while you were talking about it, I was thinking, you know, I get a lot of questions from people about how can I get booked at this place? How can I get in with this scene? And the answer nine out of 10 times is exactly what you did is that you have to create something. You know, yeah. you can't, if you sit around waiting for someone to kind of pluck you out, you're going to keep waiting. You know? True. You got to pick your own lane and you got to travel the speed limit for a little <laughs> bit, you know, and then right. when you get a break, you know, a traffic break. That's when you speed. Yeah, hundred you know? percent, man. <laughs> Peel out. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that you were throwing your own parties as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, they're not like party parties, you know, like insomniac parties. Yeah, you know, like yeah. not on that we, scale. Uh, I think I threw my first party at this uh, in L.A. For people who are familiar with L.A., it was in the Castaic Reservoir. A little bit north of Magic Mountain, like a, a north of Valencia. Mm. And uh, it was one of those places, you know, it's like a canyon. You just pull up, put some speakers there, and hopefully the cops don't shut you down. Yeah. So the first time we did it, no cops. But it was only 20, 30 people. Right. Then we were like, fuck it, we're going to make some flyers. We're going to charge people to go here. We're going to put a map point next to the 7-Eleven. <laughs> cops were there in 10 minutes. Of course. <laughs> oh, man, so many tickets got written up. And that's when I realized, you know, you got to kind of be above the board. Right. You have to do it in a place that's known for it, you know, or like. Yeah. Well, yeah, especially yeah. if you want to really grow it into a yeah, legitimate you want to grow thing. It. Yeah. And then that's when I realized, too, that, you know, being a promoter sucks. <laughs> 100%. Man. I give so much respect to the promoters out there because. Oh, yeah. That's the, I think that's the hardest job. That's out of the toughest any of job. Them. You've got to be the most social. You've got to be the person that can get everyone to the party to enjoy this music. Yeah. So you have to be the center of attention. And you're the person who gets blamed for everything. Yeah, dude. Like, whew. 
yeah. double edged sword. I used to throw my own party in Chicago for for a few years there, and I was never good at it. I always hate like I didn't hate the party, but it just stressed me out every time to do it. But it seemed like your parties got pretty successful for a while there. Oh, with the smog parties? I mean, yeah, yeah I'm skipping yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah, but, skipping ahead. That's yeah. about 10 years ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. We, yeah, we don't have to go that far yet. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. how did you get more involved with the drum and bass scene? Was it just through emceeing that you kind of started meeting all the big names? That, like, uh, it was a few things. It was uh, being an MC and also a producer at the same time enabled me to be on anyone's set and also be able to slide them a demo yeah. at any given moment. Yeah. I also had a residency at a drum and bass night in LA called Database. It was at this place called the Fay Dodo. Every month we would have a UK headliner that would come through and that's how I pretty much got my my shine. Yeah. I, at the same time I was doing a radio show on this uh internet radio station called vibe flow okay uh we had a show me kingpin and fear called medium radio and we also had djs on every week yeah so i was every wednesday i would have some dj that i'd never met that we just bought his records and if he was in town we had him play a radio show and then once a month on saturdays for database i'd get some one-on-one time with one of the uk guys yeah also being an mc i'm playing every friday thursday Sunday at some fucking shit rave in Hustling, San Bernardino man. or Pomona. You know? Yeah, that's a hustle, dude. Yeah, I mean, w- was any of that making you money? How were you supporting yourself at that time? I mean, definitely had to sell drugs. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know you're, you're selling weed, you're selling mushrooms, you're doing whatever it takes. Right. I'm not trying to incriminate myself on this podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. Is hindsight's always twenty twenty? <laughs> you know, but I mean, I remember, man, I was making. I'd probably make 50 bucks each gig. Yeah. I'd probably do three gigs a night. Yeah. That's, that's cr- barely gas, you know? I mean, that's that's almost, it makes me think of how comedians will do the open mic hustles, you know? Yeah. And hit five of them in a night and make <laughs> 50 bucks or something like that. And that's still to this day, man. It's, I respect that hustle. Yeah, man. <laughs> Going forward a little bit, how did it start to grow for you? Did Was your music received well by the people you gave it to? Uh, it wasn't really received well by the the UK guys because I feel like in the early 2000s there was a heavy stigma that like if you weren't British, um, your music sucked. Right? Yeah, it was you know? very insular, scene, very insular, very yeah. judgmental. I, I had, and I get it. You know, the UK guys were way better at making drum and bass. I mean, they invented they it. they invented it. Yeah. You know? And there weren't that many guys here that were really pushing the envelope. The only people that I really had to look up to at that time were, you know, Diesel Boy, DJ Hive, Assassin, Joe S. They were, I mean, literally the only four Americans yeah. that were really pushing things and, like, getting accepted by the English people. So right. I, I, I basically not copied their shit, but I tried to sound as much like them as sure. possible. And Which is a thing I think a lot of young producers do. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you 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 see something, you emulate it. You yeah, wanna, that's how you learn. Almost. That's how you learn. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess I'm just curious how it grew for you, and and did you have a moment where you felt like you really broke through? You really saw a real opportunity. Was there a moment for you that you felt like you know you opened a door you had been banging on? I think uh, the moment when I really felt something happen was probably 2002 EDC. Uh, my manager, who I have now, uh, Danny Johnson, him and this uh, clothing company, this drum and bass clothing company called Drums, they collabed on the drum and bass room before Bass Rush, but it yeah. was the drum and bass room for EDC. Okay, It was uh, at the Queen Mary in Long Beach. That was the first time I ever got put on a flyer, oh, you know, wow. for EDC. You know? Yeah, I was like, yeah, holy yeah. shit. That's a big this, deal. It's a big deal, you know. M- John Dada MC, MC Kemp's, they gave me the opportunity to MC with DJ Craze. And Craze, at that time, for drum and bass, he was the best guy I'd ever seen play yeah. next to Andy C. Right. I got to give him a demo. I gave him a demo. Two days later, he hit me up on AIM. Or AOL Instant Messenger. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was like, yo, this shit is dope. Like, me and my boy Juju, we're starting this label called Cartel, blah, blah, blah. And then, I I mean, I had releases before that. Right. But Craze was the only guy that I knew that was popular in England. Yeah. And popular in America. And he could- He had the cred. He had yeah. the cred. So he, he really put me on. 
this was probably 02, 03. Right after that, you know, that's when all the drum, the other UK labels started, you know, call, coming in. And, like, they believed in it. Yeah. And so that was kind of the moment. So that cosign really opened that a lot of doors for you. That cosign opened up everything for me. Wow. And then, what, and then for, in terms of drum and bass, you know, Fotech is the guy that really, really put me on. Mm. Fotech had just moved to Los Angeles, and he wanted to start a new label. You know, me and my boy Ho Chi and, and Craze, it was, he was the first guys that we called. Yeah, and that really the 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 Fotech cosign is what really put me over because sure. after that I started playing in England all the time and I started touring Europe and oh wow and that's what led me to dubstep okay pretty much yeah yeah that's uh, that's got to be a crazy time man because with the scene being based in the UK that you can just kind of once you get your foot in the door immediately go overseas and start playing out there. It's kind of different from how it works now, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, because the scenes aren't so regional anymore. You know? Shit, there's, there was no SoundCloud back then. <laughs> SoundCloud would have changed everything. I mean, this is pre-MySpace. Right. Or like when MySpace is just starting, you know? Was it pretty mind-blowing to go out to the UK the first time and kind of see the Man, home base? The first time, I mean, I, I ended up living out there. Oh, really? Yeah, I shout out that. like uh, my boy Define and shout out my boy Yergi Eric Foster. Uh, he ran a company called Box Agency and they were the first guys to give me English gigs. And I lived with them in Milton Keynes and I was writing music out there. And the only way that I could see myself going forward as an artist was to get known in England, yeah. you know, because I had already met every single one of them motherfuckers in LA right. being their MC. <laughs> so now let them, I wanted them to see me in their home, right, on their grounds. Right, you and, know? Uh, you know, drum and bass must have been much bigger there, obviously, than oh, in the much States bigger. at the time. At the time, you know, it was, yeah, fuck yeah, it was way much bigger, much yeah, bigger. It's, but, I, mean, I mean, drum and bass, up until about crack house laws, was huge, yeah. You know? Drum and bass has always had such a dedicated core fan base, you know? I think more so than a lot of other genres. Oh, yeah. The people who are passionate about it. And maybe that is why it's such a closed off scene is because, you know, it's the fandom again. Like, people know their shit. They know every detail of every record. They know about how it was made. You know, it's a very technically minded uh, genre. I've always liked that about it. And, and so, you know, you, you start touring. You're traveling all around the world doing these shows, getting your name out there. And at what point do you run into dubstep? Actually, I think the first time I heard dubstep was I was playing a drum and bass show uh, for this uh, this label I was on called Renegade Hardware. Uh, bar Legendary Barcode label. Renegade Hardware. Yeah, it was at the end. There was this group downstairs. I think they were called Slaughter Mob. Slaughter Mob, I think Scream played. I think Oris J played. Jada Flex played. And... I I remember going down in the second room at the end. Yeah. And being like, yo, this shit sounds like slow drum and bass. This is cool. Right. Know? But it's not tech like technically it's not as cool as drum and bass. <laughs> right. You know, like drum and bass is like it takes a lot of work to make one of those goddamn songs. Complex. Especially music. back then. Yeah. One well, talk about what early dubstep sounded like. Because you know, it's so different now, you know, ten years down the line. Even more than that. Oh yeah, I mean, like for me, like you know, the when I first think of dubstep, I think of like horsepower productions, and I think of Jada Flex, and I think of Benny Hill and artwork, and like these 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 songs, like the 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 groove was kind of like boom, ka, boom, ka, ka, boom, ka, boom, ka, ka, kind of like yeah. garagey a little bit, right, right. But it's like it's got like a a re, like a Reese rumble mm. underneath, yeah. That kind of groove. early wobble. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't really halftime, but I mean there was some halftime tunes, but right. It was kind of it just was more about the bass and the groove. Yeah, the bass, the groove, and the step. Right, you know? right, yeah. That yeah, makes sense. Put some dub sounds over it, and you got yourself a new genre. <laughs> did you connect with it right away? I not mean, at all. Okay. I did not connect with it. <laughs> I didn't really connect with it until my I had a buddy who makes drum and bass. His name is Tech Itch. And uh, Technical Itch was like, hey, man, have you heard of this new thing, dubstep, mate? And I was like, what are you talking about? I ain't never heard... Like, are you talking about reggae? <laughs> like, you know, he's like, nah, man. Um, he pointed me to his roommates at the time, which were, it was this guy, Headhunter, uh, who's now called Addison Groove, I believe. Oh, wow. And Jake's. 
And those are his two roommates in Bristol. And com- oh, also Common as Muck. I, I remember hearing what he, he thought Dubstep was, you know, and like what I thought Dubstep was. <laughs> and I was like, oh shit, this is way different. Right. From that, um, I had a friend in LA. And she introduced me to my friend Drew, who became my partner at Smog. And he told me about this uh, BBC mix that Marianne Hobbs did. It was called Dubstep Wars. Yeah. And that was pretty much the handbook. And like once I, le- I saw that or heard that, then I figured out, oh, there's Code 9 and DMZ, yeah. uh, Scream, Banga, like all these kind of guys. It's so rare that one mix can be the epicenter, you know, because that's such a legendary. Everybody talks about that Marianne Hobbs mix, and oh, I heard yeah. it too. <laughs> and it's, you know, to think about that one person with one mix could kind of just define a genre for people. Pretty much. It's, I, I love that, man. Or put a sound to a name. Yeah, you right, know? because you were just saying you guys couldn't even agree what it sounded like. Yeah. yeah. And at that it. time, you know, like when you have a, a artist like Burial, an artist like Code Nine on one side, and then on the other side, you have an artist like Scream and an artist like Banga, and then on another side, you have an artist like DMZ, and on another side, you have an artist like Caspa and Rusko. You no, know, it's extremely diverse. And I mean, that's like an all star team lineup, you yeah. know? All of those people are so talented. And to have them all kind of creating this new sound at the same time, I think that's a rare moment too. Straight up, I heard that mix, man. And I was on the first flight to England. Wow. I was like, we're going to DMZ two year. <laughs> and then uh, the next year, DMZ three year, the whole squad came out. Me, Drew. Oh, man. It was, I'm, I'm saying I've never, I mean, in drum and bass, I kind of felt that at Renegade Hardware where like you would go to an end show and you you know the guy next to you is from estonia the guy to the left of you is from switzerland that guy's from argentina every single person is there from a different country right. so when i went to dmz for the, my first time that's what i experienced mm. but with dubstep yeah where it's like this guy's from romania this guy's from fucking uh south africa yeah this that's guy's so from australia cool. everyone flew in for this one st- party in in Brixton right I mean just because that's the only place it was right and and the passion for the music the fact that dubstep is a a genre of music that didn't exist when we were born you know I think about that sometimes it's it's new in our lifetime it's got to be one of the youngest genres of music you know (laughs) and that's I think that's exciting to me I would say twerk maybe well, yeah, but I, you know, that kind of to me was more of a, a fad. You know? Oh, I, oh, I see what you're saying, like a genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. I, you know, it feels like it's still growing and evolving, mm-hmm. and has gone through all these different phases. I'd have to agree, uh, especially. I mean, I mean, dubstep's got a 15 year career now, you know. Right, right. You know, as opposed to like drum and bass, which is almost 25 years old. You know, yeah, that's, almost 30. That's really. crazy to think about too. Yeah. Did you start uh, trying to bring dubstep back to the states with you? Around that time? There was a guy already pushing it. His name was Joe Nice. Mm. Or his name is Joe Nice, sorry. (laughs) I love the guy. And then there was another guy from California. His name was Nick Argon. But I mean, for you and and your partner, Drew, who started Smog with you, was that when you guys really thought you could put your stamp on it, you know, for... I mean, I don't know where Drew's head was at. Actually, I kind of know where Drew's head was at. It's like the really big dubstep night at the time in England was called Forward. Every single producer of dubstep yeah. would be in that place playing their plates. Drew kind of wanted something like that in America or in LA. Sure. Just, so, just a home base. Just a home base. Come. So oh, basically yeah. what we wanted to do was look for guys who had at least 30 minutes of dubstep. Mm. Like, which at that time was really hard to find. Right. Like, literally, there was eight people. And there wasn't even that much dubstep music out There wasn't yet, that right? much dub, or Like, you couldn't get it digitally, so the yeah. guys, you know, everyone was playing vinyl. Luckily, uh, our boy Sam XL, uh, Pure Phil Sound System, he had a record store at the time called Temple of Boom, and that was the only place in L.A. that you could buy dubstep records. From there, that's where the kind of the scene was created. Right, because you'd see everyone at the store. Yeah, you'd see everyone at the store, and then every Tuesday night, we had Pure Phil which is a collaboration between Smog and 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 Sam XL and that really 
put dubstep on the map like mm. in la like it was like oh there's a place you can go on top of that you can smoke weed in there oh you can play dominoes and like <laughs> as small of a thing like as smoking weed in a venue that makes makes things cool oh yeah you know what that's i mean it's unheard of it's unheard of at yeah. that time you know <laughs> it's like wait you mean i can have a beer and a joint yeah. Like, and this is 10 years ago, you know what I mean? No, that's crazy. Now it's like, you know, it's everywhere. Right. Yeah. No, that's crazy. I didn't even know that, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's really what put everything over, in my opinion. Mm, like Interesting. That night, pure filth. and. So did it get pretty popular? It, well, I mean, the the cap was only like two or 300. Right. Like, so it, it can't get that popular. Sure. But and, if you're filling it up every week, that's still... I mean, and, and, and at the same time, just so you have a... Uh, a grasp on the era there's this shit going on with dubstep but at the same time you've got dj am doing banana split sundays right you've got steve aoki doing dim mac tuesdays at center space right you've got insomniac doing uh function wednesdays with all german bass yeah we're just kind of like the bastard child did you feel that way that you know in that wave of of electro and blog house and all that that they didn't really want to associate with dubstep yeah because no one was wearing tight jeans mm. and, you know and i feel like it was literally not overnight but it went from like if you weren't electro dressing electro you weren't cool yeah to like oh shit like you're not cool unless you listen to everything right you know what i mean you didn't have to go to just dim mac you didn't have to just go to banana splits you could go to echo park and you can go hear this weird ass fucking halftime yeah. reggae music you know well you know somebody like am i think really helped open a lot of those doors you know, oh yeah he was such an open guy oh and yeah i'm sure in la at the time a legend I, well, how did it evolve for you? I mean, you were playing dubstep at that time. Did you start getting booked to play dubstep? It, it was. It was. That's exactly how it went down. I was. Uh, I was producing drum and bass. I was playing drum and bass. I was going super hard. And then one day I just stopped getting drum and bass gigs, and I only started getting dubstep gigs. Did the drum and bass scene slow down? In it, the yeah, a little bit. Like you know, jump up. I had reigned supreme for about five years, and but it got a little bit stagnant. Mm. It was like, it was either dr jump up or it was fucking uh, pots and pans, kill your mother German bass. You know, it was no like <laughs> middle ground, you know, like boots in a dryer. Dude. <laughs> and I was making boots in a dryer. You know? Were so you? I, like, yeah, totally. Yeah. Like, I mean, at that time I'm making collabs with lime wax and all kinds of shit and I'm still touring Europe doing it. Wow. But it was literally like overnight. It was like one day I was getting booked to play German bass and then the next day it was like, oh, we, we can't book you for your normal rate for German bass but you know we got this like little coffee shop will you come play dubstep for us and we'll pay you half and I was like fuck it I mean was that tough to kind of see the the trajectory like slow down a little bit and have to sort of reassess and you it know, was start totally new... tough yeah I was sad I was depressed I didn't know what to do in my life I had spent 10 years making drum and bass and all of a sudden it was gone yeah that's why, like, you know, with any genre that you're in, especially now, especially with dubstep, like, every day is a gift. Right. You know, it could be gone. A hundred percent. I've been there. So did you kind of feel like you had to take a step backwards to start going forwards again? Dude, uh, in the words of Finn Balor, in order for an arrow to go forward, you got to pull it back. <laughs> yeah. I like that. That's exactly how I felt. It was a, a big shot to the ego, doing smaller rooms, doing, you know, way less fees but you know it's still keeping the lights on yeah. for me you know yeah of course and at this point i'm sure there was no plan b no i'm like i'm i'm balls in with yeah. production <laughs> it's either this or man fuck, i don't even know what i would do so how did dubstep end up taking off you was it a pretty quick thing like in the it was you know, within pretty a year? quick actually no it was probably within three years okay like i was uh you know, still doing the coffee shops, playing dubstep and doing that stuff. And then all of a sudden, one day, yeah, it's it, it, it's kind of crazy to think about. Yeah, it's like the electro kids kind of started embracing dubstep. Like mm. after all the Rusco stuff started coming out. Right. Um, uh, people started saying, oh, well, this stuff is cool. You know, Rusco signed to Matt Decent. Matt was Decent was say, like an electro thing, you know? Yeah. Or a blog Once, they got, once yeah. They, you get the Diplo kind of cool stamp yeah. on it. 
Was he the first one to kind of bring dubstep into those other arenas, or was Mad Decent? I would say me for sure. Well, <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, but I mean, like to the mainstream. Like that's that? what I mean. Like or signing the a main guy, like, blog house stream. That's more yeah. what I mean. Yeah, Diplo, hundred percent. He put out a. Uh, this is dubstep mix right with a hundred songs out he put one of my songs on it yeah uh, which happened to be a remix that me and flinch did for uh, trouble youth, and bass youth blood, yeah the youth right? blood remix that such a legendary record uh, which was a really big crossover electro and dubstep record you know yeah together I, and you're right because i was more in the electro scene than i was in the dubstep world at that time and i played the shit out of that record <laughs> <laughs> that was a big record and hats off to scion av you know those guys were they were really pushing things forward they were they were like oh yeah um i know you guys make only house but we're gonna give you some money. Why don't you get a remix from a drum, a dubstep guy, yeah. or a drum and bass guy? Yeah, do something different, dude. Scion kept the lights on for a lot of for people. a lot of motherfuckers. I was dude. talking about my party I threw in Chicago. I mean, they were bankrolling it more mm. or less for years. Yeah, and I don't hats know what off I, to all those guys. Like they really they helped the scene. They helped me so much as an artist, really? especially in LA for dubstep. Like they were probably the the biggest proponent of my career. You know, yeah. In what for, way? For example, we used to do this uh, monthly show at the Roxy. Uh, it was a free show, so all it was was RSVP, but first come, first serve, and they would let me pick talent. Oh. And so I'd be like, "Oh, uh, Excision's never played in LA. You know what? I'm gonna book Excision. Uh, Nero's never been in LA. I'm gonna book Nero. Uh, Rusco's never been in LA. I'm gonna book Rusco. Right. Pass, like all these people." Uh, and they just they they paid for it. Wow! They let me interview them, and uh, they filmed the interviews, and you can watch them on YouTube now. And, yeah, I sort stuff. of forgot yeah. about that. And yeah. that's that's like your emceeing earlier that you could you know interact with these guys. You provided a venue, something of value to them, and then you know that sort of strengthens your whole space in the scene, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's more ways of providing value man that's what i tell everybody you got to figure out that way oh i mean on top of that you know scion you know they put the first small compilation out you know uh the scion cd sampler with the the uh reasons dr p remix and the teflon dot sick and excision remix you know that kind of put us on the worldwide map right as opposed to just being an la united states brand yeah. We so when did global. when did Smog become a label? About 2008. Okay. Yeah, 2008. I I remember Drew and I went to England. We met up with the vinyl distributors. <laughs> 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 they gave us a contract, and they were like, you know, we'll pay for this, and we'll do this, and then we realized, you know, selling vinyl is really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The vinyl market. Like going digital as a dubstep label, like people are going to make fun of you. Right. You know? Like right. Yeah, playing any CD at again, that time again, was because bad. It, yeah. It's that culture. There's an attitude towards it, mm -hmm. a, a pretentiousness. Uh, yeah. Just an accepted way of doing things. Yeah. I was still cutting dub plates at that time, you know? Yeah. Spending $50 on, you know, one record. Right. <laughs> you know, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I just got my USB now. It's all good. You know? And so for Smog, you know, it's a label, it's a party. The name is getting out there. It's becoming a, a brand, so to speak, right? Yes. That people recognize as, as a movement beyond just an, a, an entity. For you, you start touring behind it, right? Using the Smog name to kind of bring people with you. Yes. Like, I feel like from you, I learned a lot about dubstep artists back in those days because you would bring people out with you or you would put people's records out. And were there other, I mean, I feel like there weren't a lot of other outlets like that for dubstep at the time. Yeah, I mean, at that time, you know, uh, the only guys that were really putting dubstep music out on a consistent basis, you know, you, you, you got Dub Police, you got Tempa, you got Capsize, you got Hinch. But most of those are UK based. And they're all UK yeah. based. Like, yeah, there's no real US dubstep. That's kind of what I'm I getting at. Is, you know, you really. Excision had rotten. Yeah, true. That was it. Yeah. Well, and that, pro I mean, do you think that served you well that you were, you know, the only person doing it in the States at the time? Oh, yeah. When it's a, you know, it's a, a small pond with yeah. a bunch of big fish, <laughs> you know. How did you 
see yourself at that time? You know, you were a producer, you were running a label, you were a touring DJ. Would you say you were known for any one thing? Or were you just sort of this kind of, you know, avatar of US dubstep at the time? I feel like I, the media portrayed me as an avatar of dubstep, but how I felt, I just thought I was a good friend. Yeah. You know, like you want to come play in America? We're going to book you. We're going to put you up in our crib. You're going to stay with us for a week. We're going to rage. You're going to have a great time. I'll show you the Hollywood sign. Sure. You know, like I'm going to treat, you know, like with the utmost respect. And you were living in the compound already at oh, that yeah. point, right? Oh, yeah. And I think that's worth mentioning. Just what is the compound for the listeners who don't know? Uh, the compound is uh, where I live. I live with my manager. I've been living with him for 10 years. We're... Which is unheard of, by the way. Homogenous. Nobody else does that. <laughs> yeah. He's, you know, he brought me out of the trap house, man, straight to the big leagues. I'm forever grateful. We've had a 20 year relationship, and where we've lived has been in the epicenter of bass music for a long time. Right. Like, I mean, it, that physical location has had so many important people in it, so many moments that I've heard of. I mean, I've been there a bunch of times, but then you hear about all these legendary moments, you know? And every time I've been there, there's a bunch of different people over. There's artists, you know, it's a very active atmosphere. Yeah, we're in we're in downtown Los Angeles in between three different major venues. Every time someone comes into town, their show is across the street or three blocks away. Yeah. So it's like, why don't you stop by? Yeah. And like, you know, I, some of the meetings that have gone down in there, it's unprecedented, man. <laughs> it's like, I, I've seen some shit go down. Yeah. <laughs> in a good way. Like right. In a good way. Yeah. It's like a clubhouse almost. Pretty you know? much. Yeah. A lot of scenes don't have that, don't yeah. have a central meeting place. I think that's really valuable. I mean, I remember, you know, you talking about Skrillex sleeping on the couch there for what, months, right? Yeah, months. Yeah. Uh, same with AC Slater too, man. Same with Carnage. It's like a rite of passage, man. Yeah, <laughs> man. We we uh we used to have this brown futon in my studio, man. That thing was a DNA colada. <laughs> <laughs> what do you remember about early Skrillex, the first time you met him, the first few times you encountered him? What was he like back then? He's always been a stand up guy. Speaks his mind, but treats everyone with respect. You know, I yeah. I, I kind of saw that common bond. Mm. with him you know? yeah you were just talking about that yeah yeah he is a beautiful soul in general on yeah. top of being like a very talented artist yeah no i mean one of the nicest people in dance music yeah. at any level oh yeah 100 yeah. percent. which is just a crazy thing for how big he's gotten you know at the time when you first met him were you able to see that he had the potential to be you know something crazy like he is now I mean, I didn't think he was going to be the big DJ guy. Yeah. Like, when I first met him, I thought he was going to be a huge crossover singer mm. that, like, you know, like, sang over dubstep records. Yeah. And that he wrote, you know what I mean? Right. Like, so I was like, oh, shit, like, he's going to be a Lady Gaga for dubstep. Yeah. You know, he's going to take. I knew he was going to take dubstep to the next level, but I didn't think he was going to take it to the next <laughs> level. Well, and I remember, you know, when he won that Grammy, that yeah. first Grammy, and he shouted you out uh, in his speech and, and the compound, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. right? I mean, that was a really heartwarming moment. I remember I was just at home watching the stream or something, but I, even I, I got like kind of emotional about it because, <laughs> you know... I guess because I had been there and because I knew you guys and it really did feel like a community effort. You know? Oh, yeah. And that's like those late nights, those crazy vibe sessions where, you know, you got 10 guys in the studio doing crazy shit, not even working on Sonny's tunes or my tunes or whatever, but the synergy that comes from that. Like, you don't forget those sessions, you know. And the fact that he kept it real, you know, it was like at that time, you know, there was a new artist coming over every day. Right. We were hearing music from people, you know, that the songs probably wouldn't get released t till two or three years later. Yeah. So being ahead of the curve and 
being able to just vibe and and hear new ideas and learn new techniques on how to use massive at the time and right right yeah it's it was, like a little petri dish it's a it's a fucking petri dish man <laughs> straight up so since we're talking about skrillex maybe we should talk about the advantages and the disadvantages that happen when a scene like dubstep blows up yeah right because skrillex you know becomes this worldwide phenomenon and not only him, a lot of other artists, their profile rises really fast, yours included. And with that comes attention and money and status and, you know, all the, the things that you want when you work at a job for 10, 20 years. But, you know, I think also there's negatives that people don't think about when you get that much exposure. Well, I guess just how did you experience it? I mean, overall, obviously, it was a great time for dubstep. But uh, did you have any reservations or encounter any blocks along the way that you can think of? Man, at that time, we were going so fast, I, I couldn't even think straight. Yeah, I couldn't even process I it. couldn't even process what was going on. I was playing a music that was like in relative obscurity to going on tour for 280 days with my dog doing two shows a night. Yeah. There's no time to even process what's going on. Only thing that I personally saw is that everyone was trying to copy him. Right. That kind of got me bummed out a little bit. Yeah. But I get it. It's like, if he's the best, why not sure. emulate him? Sure, you of know? course. Of course. Uh, you know, you were saying it's hard to process it. I mean, could you even enjoy it at the time? Or I would... enjoyed every single <laughs> okay, second good. of it. <laughs> I, I loved every moment from 2010 to 2012. That was the f most fun I've ever had in my DJ career in my life. Mm. You know? Was that the time period, like 2010 to 2012, where you felt like everything really changed? Everything changed right then. I feel like the biggest year for dubstep before that was probably 09. Yeah. Big Rusco year. That's when like dubstep got cool and accepted by the electro and blockhouse crowd. Right. 2010 is kind of when it came into its own. And then when Mothership came around, that changed everything. Like, yeah. It was like Daft Punk, Coachella status. Right. But with dubstep. <laughs> like, yo, my boy had the fucking, the, the Mothership. You know, it's the first time you ever see projection mapping. Oh, okay. In a dubstep realm. Like, right. it's not Amon Tobin right. doing this live. Right, like, right. This is like a... Yeah, it's this really artistic, really high-end way of presenting this music. That giant Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but, you know, for this music that maybe before that had kind of this lowbrow perception, you Agreed. know, from, yeah. from the outside. And I think that's one thing that Skrillex really did was he was just so good and presented it in such an interesting way that it... You know, you couldn't really hate on it, even if you were that sour kind of hater dude, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, in 2012, 2013, did it take a dip? Do it you think really it got too saturated? I don't think dubstep took a dip. I felt like that's the time when, in order to be, like, respected dance music artists, you needed to be a multi-genre person. Mm. You needed to be like, oh, Here's my EP. I got one dubstep song. I got a trap song. I got a house complex show song. I got like a hip hop song and right. I got a pop song. Right. There's my EP. <laughs> you know, like everyone kind of copying like the Skrill format, you know? Did you feel that pressure to yeah, do that? Yeah, totally, with your man. Own? Like if you listen to my music at that time, I'm doing the same exact thing yeah. as everyone, you know? And I think we went on this tour, Smog City, uh, in 2014. That's when I re fell in love with dubstep. Like, I think I was at some show and um, this kid was like, Yo, you're like blah, blah, blah of dubstep. I, I read it in Rolling Stone, I read it in this magazine, but you only played like three dubstep songs in your set, bro. I was like, Shit, you're right. <laughs> I played like four house songs, I played four 100 songs, yeah. I played four 175 songs i yeah. played you know what i'm saying like yeah, yeah, i yeah. went the entire gamut of the bpm spectrum right and at that time it was very acceptable but you know that's not what i'm known for i'm yeah. known for fucking dubstep dude and that's when everything started to click and i fell in, i re-fell in love with dubstep yeah also um r.i.p my homie baron but the music that he was making and requake and bad clat 
it just kind of another wave of it was like another new ideas new well, yeah dude it wasn't like the same bro step stuff or the same like kind of skrillex sounding melodic dubstep or yeah even the same scream sounding or right. benga sounding songs it was like really different well and and that's what we need right is even now you know i think about today's current dance music genres and with a lot of i'm not naming names but with a lot of those genres it's a lot of copycat stuff going on right yeah and i think we see a genre will pop up for a year two years and then it's done you know like big room house is maybe the best example of that where it came out of nowhere it was this crazy new sound i fell in love with it. i think a lot of other people did Likewise. yeah and and then a year later it had not progressed at all all the songs sounded the same and it just literally ran itself into the ground, you know? And I think for a genre to survive, I've been talking about this a lot with, with people on this show, that you know, you have to make the risky choices and you have to try the new ideas, even if it doesn't work, even if people don't like it. Because if you just keep kind of pushing the ball forward, making the same shit, even if it works in the short term, how far can that take you, really? I agree. I mean... Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one, man, because half of me is like, be original. The other half of me is like, people don't appreciate originality anymore. <laughs> they used to. Right. Well, it's risky, right? It's super risque. Yeah. <laughs> but those originals who really do get recognized by people who make that connection, I mean, those are the people who are going to be the torchbearers for the next wave, right? I agree. Things are moving so fast now. I guess that's my point is that, you know, if you tie your, your wagon to just this one horse, you're going to get past. That horse is going to die. You know, you got to switch them. I like the rhythm horse though right <laughs> now. <laughs> and that's, that's where we're headed with this, I think, is that, you know, 2014, 2015, you fall back in love with dubstep. You kind of reclaim the title that everyone kept trying to give you of, of this <laughs> U.S. Uh, dubstep king. It seems like throughout your whole career, you've had that title kind of thrust at you, you know, like U.S. dubstep godfather, the dubstep king. Do you feel any pressure from that? Do you feel like you kind of have to carry a torch or that you have to guide the next generation? Like, do you like it? Do you, does it bum you out? Does it make you anxious? I'm 50 50 with it. You yeah. know, like I said before, you know, when uh, in 2014, when the person at this party told me that I wasn't playing that much dubstep, that's when I really felt the pressure. But yeah. now it's like, man, this is routine shit <laughs> i love it dude like i love every minute of what's going on with dubstep right now do you feel a responsibility for the scene i have no responsibility like i feel like i could turn into a house producer overnight huh. and i care interesting but i love making dubstep yeah so <laughs> well and that clearly shows yeah man. yeah and i think that's what you have to do you have to do what you love what you're passionate about and that's i, I guess that's what i kind of meant it's like if i'm passionate about something i'm gonna be balls deep in it right regardless of what genre it is yeah a hundred percent even if it's like if i want to be a wrestler i could turn into a wrestler if i want to you know? <laughs> oh i could see i just it. if i get behind something i'm one thousand percent behind it yeah man well, talk about you've linked up with Disciple now. Yeah. And is is Smog done? Smog is not done. Okay. Smog Smog is uh it's going. Uh Disciple's going. Yeah. Roundtable Disciple is going. That's your label with Disciple. Yeah, that's my label with Disciple. My partner in Smog, uh Drew. He started a really awesome company called Eminent Domain. Yeah. Which is, uh, they're making visuals. He's for, killing it. He's crushing it. Yeah, dude. he's doing really well. I love the guy. Uh, he's doing all my visuals. He's doing Flosser Damas. You can go down his uh, Rolodex. And yeah, he's been he's doing crushing a lot it. of big work. He's a busy guy. So I wanted to try something different with the uh, Disciple guys. Sure. We're all based in LA and. It is what it is. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, their movement is really blowing up right now. I think they have a lot of exciting young talent. Great talent. Yeah. Great talent on the label. Yeah, absolutely, man. And for you, you know, kind of being given your own label as a part of that with the round table, that's got to be an exciting way for you. I mean, this whole conversation, we've been talking about how you, one thing you keep doing is bringing people in and linking with people that you, that you admire, whose music that you like. 
And to me, this just strikes me as a really smart way to keep doing that for another generation of kids. Oh, yeah. And the guys that we got on Roundtable right now are bar none some of my favorite producers out there right now. Yeah. You know, it's just really cool to work. You know, it's like the same capacity that, you know, we were doing at Smog and stuff. But um, it's like a 10-man team as opposed to just me and Drew. Right, you right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, and with dubstep being kind of popular again in, like, I feel, at least for me, because I've never been 100% in the dubstep scene, but as an outside admirer, you know, I would see it kind of bubble up for a few years and then go back down a little bit and then bubble back up. And it feels like right now, uh, at least for ticket sales, it's never been better. It's never been better. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm trying to, like, compare it to, like, you know, in the 2010 to 2012 run. Like, yeah, there's no, like, stadium dubstep parties like how there used to be. Right. But we're also seeing the biggest dubstep parties of all time. Right. Lost Lands. Yeah. Uh, Rampage. Yeah, the like, appeal is much wider now, right? Yeah, dude, when Excision can sell 30,000 fucking tickets, man, this is awesome. Yeah. This is great. Lost Lands is the best party I've been to in a long time. I wasn't and there, was but I heard all some amazing dubstep, things. Man, crazy. Heard some amazing things about that. Shout out to Excision. Shit, that, they, they went on sale last night and they sold 15,000 tickets. Damn. Now that is what I'm talking about. <laughs> dubstep is alive and well. Well, and you mentioned rhythm. I don't even really know how to define rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> like how did you encounter it at first you know this is like a slippery slope like yeah. i feel like you're backing me into something right now. <laughs> i'm not asking I you to define it but i mean yeah. how did you encounter it on tour like proto hype was one of the real guys that really put me on to it he was like yo you gotta hear this guy uh he's got you gotta hear dub loads you gotta hear troll face you gotta hear uh back clat and requake yeah and this is probably 13 or 14 or something i i just fell in love with the music Rock the Bells by Jakes was kind of like, in my opinion, like what people call rhythm now. Yeah. I feel like that was like the first one. Well, and we were talking about your early encounters with dubstep where it was about, you know, sort of the baseline and about the groove of it. And to me, as again, an outsider, that's kind of what rhythm in 2017 feels like is a return to being about the groove and not so much about the the build up and the drop but yeah, you know exactly. kind of just letting it ride and exactly well and just like we were saying a minute ago i think it's important for the lifespan of dubstep it's a young art form it needs to keep evolving it needs to keep changing if everyone just kept making this heavy drop bro step headbanger stuff which i have no problem with but if they kept Agreed. doing it for years and didn't try any other ideas, you know, I think that would be, that's a ceiling on how far it can go. But if it keeps evolving, I, I'm all for it, man. <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like rhythm is is one of those things that gets made fun of a lot from the outside. Yeah, just like, just by name. Yeah, it's, you know? yeah the name is a little dicey. <laughs> yeah, it's dicey as fuck, dude. <laughs> I mean, I we got plenty of dance hall homies that know what rhythm is. Well, but. sure. But even, I mean, dubstep's the same way, right? I'm sure there's some of the old UK dudes who are not happy with the current, you know, definition of dubstep. Completely understood. <laughs> Which, yeah I, yeah, I get it. But uh, a lot of those guys got mad when Skrillex won two gram or six Grammys, too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you feel that from the UK guys once the US? Scene? Not at all. Really? Not once. I mean, even you know, you can read articles by Scream and Banga where they praise everyone from us and like at the end of the day the only people that i really give a shit about are the guys that give a shit about me yeah from mala all the way to casper rusco scream bang and all that yeah stuff. all those guys have a huge respect for the american dubstep scene they show love they sign the same guys sure yeah yeah well and you guys are showing love right back you know i always yeah, like i always liked that it was a reciprocal thing yeah yeah it doesn't always work that way there might be dubstep beef. Like, I mean, if you go on Twitter or in face, Facebook right now, you're going to see hella dubstep beef. Right, right. But it's not like from the OGs to the, 
the yeah. younger guys. There's no beef like that. Yeah, yeah. You know? The people are really in charge. It might be one producer against another producer, <laughs> but it is what it is, you know? Yeah. Controversy sells. Sure, man. Well, and that's back to wrestling, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you want a feud. You want to see a feud. Yeah, you yeah. You want to see who wins, man. That's <laughs> WrestleMania. <laughs> man, to, to bring this home, I, I usually like to try to talk, if it's somebody I know like you, and I've known you for years. Yes, sir. I, I don't really remember how we met but i do remember how i first became aware of you i was gonna say probably through brills do you think so yeah Man. i feel like the first time i ever heard your shit was through brills well yeah that, that like could a be. long time ago. that very well could be yeah. uh, but i definitely was aware of you before that with the scion compilations and all of that that was when i first found your music and i I think the first time, I don't even know if I met you, but the first time I saw you, and then I always have this association in my mind, was South by Southwest, you were always at the Sunday dubstep party. Mad Classy Barcelona. Yeah. And I mean, that's, we, uh, AKA church. <laughs> it really was, man. Even for me, and I wasn't connected to any of those entities. Like, I was DJing there, I was there performing, but I had nothing to do with that world. But every Sunday, I would always leave a day late so I could go to that party on the Sunday at South by, and I would see you play. You know, and then I saw you were playing some of my songs, and I don't think I even knew how you got them at the time. Oh, dude, that's Super Thread. Shout out Super Thread. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Like old Super Thread. Right, yeah. the, the, back when everyone liked being on the Super Thread. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For the listeners, the Super Thread was this legendary email thread that uh, kind of every big producer in across multiple genres was on. It was probably 200 people, <laughs> all, all the biggest names in, in the production world were on this one email string. And by the end, it probably had... 500 a thousand messages and it was how we shared music you would just send your your shit to the the list and it would go to everybody the original super thread takes me back man oh, it was so i feel like dj snake started the original super thread i mean not to take anything away from nappy but i remember when uh dj snake sent out the aluna george remix mm, i remember that too I, I don't even know if it was aluna george at that time it was like a another 100 tune right like <laughs> But with no vocals and shit. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I want to send this to like all my friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. That was probably the seed yeah. of the idea. And then it was like, well, if you're sending this, well, maybe I should send my song as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, email list is the great equalizer, man. Everybody Straight feels up. like they have to participate. <laughs> well, you know, so at this point for you, man, I mean... You've been here as this solid figure through all of these ebbs and flows of, of the dance music industry of dubstep. Where are you at with it in 2017? I mean, it seems like things are going really well. Dubstep's doing really well. What are you excited about right now? Do you have any anything you're working on for the future? Oh, yeah, working on my next EP, coming out Disciple next next year. I really feel that, I mean, I'm not writing this kind of music, but I feel like next year is going to be the year of heavy metal step. Mm. After going to all these shows, there's like mosh pits going. It's like a heavy metal concert yeah. when you go to a dubstep show. Now. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, Even the dancing has changed. The dancing has changed. It's a lot more head banging, a lot more of that stuff. So I feel like it's going more towards yeah. death metal. Is, is that a direction you support? You like that? I support it, but I, I don't think I'll make it. Right. I understand, and I feel like that's like the new hot shit. But then there is, there's more experimental stuff being made at the same time, right? Yeah, dude, because, yeah, you can hear that, and then you hear Ivy Labs. Right. And they're like, oh, my God, Ivy Labs are so, <laughs> they're so good. Yeah, and maybe they're not playing the main stage at Lost Lands, but, you know, yeah. like we've been talking about this whole time, I think that you need the, someone like them to balance the scales, yeah. right, and keep the art form evolving. I think that throughout this whole conversation, I never really realized how young of an art form dubstep is. I just keep <laughs> thinking about that and how it's like, it's still like a kid. It's like a teenager. It's literally know? a teenager. Yeah. And a you, pubescent teenager. <laughs> <laughs> Very hormonal. <laughs> Very hormonal. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, man. Is there anything else we should talk about? Anything we left out? Anything you want to add? Donald Trump sucks. Yeah, fuck Donald Trump. <laughs> fuck Donald Trump. 
All right, peace, man. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't about politics. <laughs> it's about rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's the show. So much love to 12th Planet for sitting down with me, having that chat, being so open. Man, that was a good one. I hope you guys had a good one, too. I hope you're having a great end of your year. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. For real, I'm so thankful all you guys are here with me sharing all these conversations. I love making this show for you guys. It's going to be bigger and better in 2018. We've already got the first few months of guests lined up. It's looking big. So that's it, guys. My name is Willie Joy. Email me at backtobackpod at gmail.com or hit me up on social media at Willie Joy on all social media or you can hit up the show at backtobackpod. I hope you guys have a good week. I hope you have a good New Year's, and I will see you in the future, 2018. Here we come. Peace. <laughs>